Well, myself and Mary would love to thank you for coming along today and uh, hopefully we'll enjoy each other's company today. <laughs> and we've just come back from Villamina. Uh, so we spent three, or three days, I think it was, up there. Um, it was a bit colder there than here. Uh, minus 15 or something like that. But uh, it was beautiful, just snow everywhere, quite thick, metre deep or so. And uh, myself and Mary have never really been in that kind of environment for an extended stay before, so it was quite unique for us. And uh, so we managed to spend a bit of time with some of the people who are in the audience up there, and we really enjoyed that. We'd like to, before we get started actually, just thank those of you who have donated funds for us to come here. Um, this weekend and next weekend, and also for our stay during the week. Um, we, myself and Mary, we live off of donations we receive. We don't ask for funds, but people donate depending on how good or bad the uh, <laughs> presentations are and how much you've enjoyed receiving the information. And so uh, we'd like to thank you for that opportunity to come here and speak to you as a group. Um, we've had, uh, we, we are also going to other locations and, and many of the people who have donated funds in Sweden have actually made it possible for us to go to other locations too. And so those other locations are including we, England, where we came from before we were here, uh, also Athens, and uh, also we'll be going across to the United States for a week as well and spending a bit of time over there. Um, doing very similar things to what we'll be doing here today and tomorrow. And we bring greetings from lots of people. Oh yes, Australia. yes, we bring greetings from lots of people. There were a few hundred people in Australia that wanted to bring their greetings to you and to say hello to you. Some of you know them, uh, others of you do not, but uh, whenever we travel, generally there's lots of people in Australia that like us to send their love along with us, so please receive <laughs> their love. Um, we also, um, if you would like us to do the same for other countries, we'd be happy to do that. <laughs> so that, that would be lovely. Okay, I don't know if there's too many... Oh, there's a few DVDs up the back that uh, some people in Greece have brought along with them that are for free that you can take with you if you've never seen a DVD or any of the material that uh, we have presented. How many of you, have, have, this is the very first time you've seen me, you've never seen a DVD or a YouTube video or anything else? How, how many of you, how many of you in that, so a couple? How many of you have actually watched a few um, of the YouTube videos or watched a DVD or two? Um, how many of you? So most of you. So the general plan of action is that we generally respond to the audience's requirements when we give a talk, but I would like to discuss a few things with you initially, particularly to help those people who have never uh, had a talk uh, or, or listened to some material, just to talk about some basic things first, and then we generally respond to their questions of the audience. And you'll notice that Joy is standing there, and she's pointing that at me at the moment, but later, as you ask questions, it gets pointed at you. Um, she has a microphone on the top of it and normally we get to hear that. The reason why we do that is that often we find questions that people ask. People in other locations have also asked or would like to know the answers to. And so what we do with every presentation is it's ed edited and generally put, placed on YouTube, on, on the internet, so that anybody can see it if they wish to. So in about six weeks to eight weeks time, you will be able to see yourself on YouTube if you wish. Um, through this process, we have some people in Australia that edit these videos and, and place them on the internet. We also have a service that we're offering this week to all of you that all of the DVDs and videos and documents that we've produced um, that are currently available either on YouTube or on our, our website, which is, just write that down, www.divinetruth.com and we have all of the documents and, and sound recordings and videos on that site and also on YouTube 
available on one hard disk drive. And what we do as a service while we're in a location, and it will also be available afterwards once a person volunteers to do it in Sweden, um, is that we uh, are able to copy onto your own hard disk drive all of that material, if you wish. Now, it's, uh, at this stage, it's around 330 gig gigabytes of data. So if you wish to have that service, if you bring along a small hard disk drive, um, but that has at least 330 gigabytes free or more on it, we can copy it for you during the week and give it back to you next weekend if you're going to come back next weekend to the, to the talk as well. Um, we do everything we do for free, but uh, if you can provide the drive, the hard disk to us, and we can do that for you during the week while we're here. Now, it takes around six hours to do that, to copy that data. So if we have 30 people all want that service, then it's unlikely we're going to get that, all of you copied. So um, we will probably ask somebody who knows us here in Sweden to do that service for you after we've gone. And that way, all of that material is available to you without having to go onto the internet all the time to uh, download the material or use your bandwidth for downloading material. Now, is there any general questions before we get started about where everything is here? The toilets are up the back um, through, the, through the exit door there. We're going to have a break about halfway through, probably, so a couple of hours. And um, feel free to leave any time you wish. You don't have to stay um, through anything. So we encourage people to follow their desires uh, all the time. So don't feel that you're being rude if you just feel like you want to get up and walk out. Now, I, I might say many things that will make you feel a little challenged sometimes and uh, sometimes I've had even half of the audience walk out about some of the things that I've spoken about. <laughs> so, so don't be afraid to, to do that. Yeah. We'll still love you <laughs> even if you do that. And so we'd like to encourage you to not endure something that you're not enjoying. Does that make sense? So stay if you enjoy it. If, feel free to leave if you don't enjoy it. Um, I don't think there's anything else we need to state to anyone. The general plan of action is I'll be speaking probably most of today. Um, tomorrow, if Mary's feeling up to it, she, she feels like she'd like to do a little bit of spirit channeling for you, um, where some spirits would like to talk to you. And so uh, tomorrow probably, um, I think... Tomorrow we start at one again, don't we, tomorrow? Yes. So tomorrow, probably around that time, we'll do some spirit channeling, um, if Mary feels like she wants to. Uh, aside from that, uh, we will talk about different subjects, but mostly subjects that we feel from yourselves that are important to you. After I've done a bit of an introduction. Are there any general questions about things before we get started at all? Everyone's... Fine. Um, it, it, with regard to your questions, if you just put up your hand, um, then everything's nice and orderly. I actually had to remove a few people from our last seminar who were rude, being rude all the time, so we had to send them out. Um, so if you can just allow, put your hands up if you want to ask a question. I'll try to address every question uh, where possible. Okay. So how are you feeling? <laughs> Good. And um, we're feeling pretty good. Myself and Mary. Yeah. We had a good rest yesterday, so that was excellent. We'd been speaking for three days straight, pretty much before then. So um, it's good to have a rest day every now and then. Our general plan for the week is that we'll be speaking today. Tomorrow is in a different venue. I understand, <coughs> isn't it, Johan? A venue yes. a bit further out of town. Mm -hmm. um, and then next... Uh, we're back. Ne Saturday. Next Saturday, yeah, we're isn't back it? Here. We're back here. Yeah. Yep. Yep. So this, and then um, the other three times that we'll be speaking. Good day. Well, today I wanted to speak with you a bit about what's real spirituality in comparison to pseudo-spirituality. What I'd call pseudo-spirituality. And what I find in our travels is that 
Many people are very fascinated with investigation, right? Investigation of all sorts of things. So there are many people we meet who are scientific or have the science background in their nature or an engineering background in their nature, and they're very fascinated about investigating scientific things, scientific matters, or engineering background, like turning science into practical applications. We also meet very many people who have come from religious backgrounds. So how many of you here have come from different religious backgrounds in your childhood? Yeah, quite a, a few of you. Right, so a few of the audience have. And is Sweden a very religious location generally? No. Not, not really? No worries. And how many of you have come from like a new age sort of a background where you're interested in new age spirituality? How many of you would classify it? So quite, quite a lot of you. So you could say you come from that background. So when, it, when you come along to a talk uh, that I give, obviously those particular backgrounds are going to influence how you interpret the information that I present. That makes sense, doesn't it? Now, what I'm going to suggest today is that there are basically only three important things to remember with regard to developing yourself in any way. Three important things to remember. And I would call all of these important things to remember a part of your spiritual nature. And the reason why I feel there's only three things to remember is that every bit of development you can do inside of yourself in terms of how you interact with the world around you is dependent upon these three particular things, these three particular qualities if you like, or, or desires that you may have. And what I find is that the majority of New, new Age and other spiritual paths finish up forgetting these three basic principles. So in other words, we get so involved in investigation, <coughs> scientifically or metaphysically or in other, in other ways, that we forget the three basic, basic principles of what, are going to make our, what is going to make our life happy but, and enjoyable, but also what is going to with it, be with us forever in our development. If, and if we can remember these three basic things in every single thing we do, in every single application that we have a part of, it, of in our lives, then we will benefit immensely. So what are those three things? Well, let's look at the first one. Now, in the first century, I mentioned all of these three things, and I'll, I'll read you a few Bible verses for those of you who have a religious background, where I refer to these things in the first century too. But the first one is a quality that's inside of yourself, or can be inside of yourself, called humility. Now, I would define humility as a passionate desire to experience all of your own emotions and feelings and to be open to everything that happens to you around, surrounding you, everything in the universe surrounding you happening to you, be opening, open to that, even if those things are hard to deal with. In other words, that you take personal responsibility for absolutely everything that happens in your life and you don't blame anybody else or try to make, be angry with anybody else or try to make anybody else responsible for those things happening in your life. You, within yourself, allow yourself to feel everything rather than blaming anyone else for what you're feeling. That's what I'd classify as humility. It also has this flavour, if you like, where you are open to receiving new information. Does that make sense? You're open to receiving new information. If we can uh, turn off all mobile phones, thanks. And where you're open to receiving all new information and you are free to receive all of that information inside of yourself. You don't have a blockage to doing so. So if you can think of you as an, as an individual, so let's draw you just as a, a circle if you like. I might just get my markers because they're a bit thicker. Let's call that your soul, which we can define a bit later if you wish to. This soul of yours is completely open to experiencing everything rather than trying to prevent the experience of everything. You see, in our day-to-day -day life, the majority of times, 
we are quite close to experiencing everything. So for example, we walk out the door here and there's a cutting wind flowing through. And what do we do? We don't experience it. What do we do instead? We cover up, cover up, another layer, another layer on, until we don't have to experience that experience. Now that's a physical thing. Let's talk about more to do with emotional things. So if you're interacting at work with another person and the person starts to get angry with you, now most of us will do one of two things in that situation. We will either want to leave the person because we don't want to experience their anger, or we'll stay there and get angry back, generally. And we'll get annoyed back. And that's, a way, that's another way of defending the rage coming at us. But we don't want to just stay there and absorb it to actually feel the attack. We don't want to feel the experience that's happening to us, generally. We generally want to get away from it. Now, humility allows us to experience every experience that happens to us and to be open even to new experiences. To be open to hearing new things that before we would never have imagined we'd listened to. And recently I met a person um, from Canada who, and we met her, met her in the presentation in England, and she said three months ago if you told her that uh, she would be listening to a guy who calls himself Jesus and talking about God, she would, told, she would have told you that she, you'd be totally crazy. Because she never had an eye concept of God. She never believed in any religious thing at all in her, in her entire life. And up until three months ago, she, um, she was only involved in her general day-to-day -day life. They have a very big business, worldwide business, and uh, they're just doing things to do with the business. And something came along in her life that caused her to, li to listen and she was open to doing so. That's humility. Being open to hearing new things. Now up until then she had lived a life as a lawyer and uh, 23 years in a, in, in a firm and during that time if anybody had told her that down the track she would actually listen to somebody talking about God, she would have told them that that would be very stupid to actually conceive such a thing. Her family life was that she never was presented about God except as a child, and, he, and then after that all of her family left religion, and uh, she would never have considered listening about God in her entire life, she thought. Now that's not humility. That is being closed and guarded, trying to prevent things from coming to you. So this aspect of humility is very, very important. In the first century I said that most people have blocked their ears and closed their eyes to receiving anything new. And isn't that the truth? We go around our day to day life a lot of the times and we have no concept of even what's happening to our next door neighbour, let alone the city we're living in or the country we're living in. We, we become blind to certain things. And it's generally only things that are fear-based that enter our life. You know, anything to be afraid of, that enters our life. Anything that's to do with new investigation, it's very hard for it to enter our life because many times we are already blocked to receiving it before we even begin. That has to change. If we are going to grow for, forever, if we are going to always continue growing in our soul, we need to allow ourselves to be humble to new things. We need to allow ourselves to be able to conceive that many of the beliefs that we have are very, very different to the truth. And being humble allows us to see that. Now, is there any questions about humility before I go on with the next essential thing? No? Everyone's fine with humility. You're all very humble. <laughs> 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 Try to. An interesting thing about humility is that we often think we're being humble, but, but years later we realise that we weren't in that particular thing, whatever it was that we were looking at. And uh, sometimes, I don't know about you in your life, but sometimes things get presented to us many times before we're humble. Have you noticed that? 
like the same thing comes up again, the same thing comes up again, the same thing comes up again. That's it. If the same thing is happening over and over again in our life, then it's a very good indication we're not humble enough yet. Because when you're humble, things change, things start changing. Right? And true humility allows for change. But if the same thing is happening, so, so for example in our lives for some of us it might be we were married when we were young, and then we got divorced in our late, late twenties, and then we married another person, and wow, they almost seem like they were the first person in a different body. <laughs> right? Now that's an indication that we're not humble. Does that make sense? That we haven't learned something that we need to learn. So that's humility. Humility. The quality of humility is essential. The next quality that's very important that we need to learn to have a love of is truth. Now, I'm not speaking here of your own ideas that you think are truth. I mean two types of truth that we need to be humble to. Let's look at both of them. So, one type of truth that we need to be humble to is universal truth. I also call this God's truth, or if you want another term, absolute truth. Now, I know many people on earth don't really believe in absolute truth. They feel that there are so many different ideas and there's so many different truths <coughs> and it's up to the individual to select which one they want to accept. Now, I don't agree with that philosophy myself. I feel that if there is a God, an entity that created us, then it would make sense that that entity would know all truth. And if that entity knows all truth, then all we need to do is somehow connect to that entity and we will start to receive truth from that entity. Now, because the most, most people on earth don't connect to that entity, they, um, most people on earth are very self-reliant rather than God-reliant, then of course they have to determine truth using a process of experimentation and, uh, and what I would call creation, the creation of experiments is what I would call a very slow way of discovering truth. So, for example, if you're a scientist <coughs> and you want to come up with a new form of technology, let's say it's a cure for cancer. What they do is they investigate the disease, then they come up with theories which they need to attempt to prove, in, in other words, through medical processes. So what they do is they come up with a theory as to what might cure the cancer and then what they try to do is create a, another, usually many times for many other diseases it's been another virus or another uh, uh, living organism that will attack the cancer and therefore destroy it. And they come up with these theories and then they've got to create something that will test the theory and then they've got to test the theory on a mice or, or a rat and eventually maybe something a bit more closer to a human like a pig or something like that. And then eventually they get to do trials on humans and then eventually we have a cure. Now for many diseases that's been 50 years of time that that, that goes on for. Now I don't know about you but I feel that's a very slow way of creating something that cures something else. It's a very slow way. If we found out everything about the cancer in terms of what's truly happening, what's really occurring, we would know fairly instantly what the cure is, if we knew everything about it. And we have scientists now, for instance, with cancer, still investigating what causes it, because it is unknown, generally, in the scientific community. We know that certain things, certain cells eat other cells, and there is some reason why that occurs, but we don't know the reason of why that starts in some people and not other people. And once we know all of that, once we know all of those reasons, then it would be a lot easier to come up with a cure. But unfortunately, we have to investigate all of those things. Now, to me, God already knows what the cure of cancer is. Being the creator of us, 
God would know why cancer would even come into existence. So therefore, if I could somehow connect to absolute truth, I could find the answer to that question as to what the cure is, very, very rapidly. But the majority of us don't think that way, and so we would prefer this other way of investigation. Right? Now, I feel there is such a thing as absolute truth. I don't know what you feel, but maybe we can discuss this a little. There is such a thing, in my opinion, as universal truth. And if we're humble, we will be open to receiving that idea as a potential idea. Yeah? But if we're closed, we won't be humble to receiving that idea. Yeah? Truth number two that we need to be open to. What do you reckon it might be? Now, none of you have already heard some of this, can answer. Personal truth? Personal truth. What do we mean by personal truth? Well, what I mean by it is not what we'd like to believe ourselves to be, but rather how we truly are from this person's perspective, from God's perspective. That's what I would call personal truth. So, in other words, some of us would like to be, we're very like to believe we're very friendly people. But you know, on a Friday night after you've been working the entire week and you've been kept late at work for another hour because the boss asked you to when really what you wanted to go home, and now you're hungry and you're driving home and you're thinking, I oh, will get my favourite pizza, let's say. You pull into the shop where the favourite pizza is normally delivered and they've closed. What are you feeling now? Now there's a feeling of a noise, a bit of frustration and so forth coming in, right? Now we're not so polite, generally. Even if we're polite outwardly, often we're not polite inside of ourselves, to, in terms of our true feelings. We, don't, we feel some degree of frustration, some annoyance and other emotions. You then go home, so you're now without the meal, you go home and your wife's home and she's been home all day and she's gone swimming and she's been relaxing at the solarium and doing another of other things and there's no dinner. What do we feel now? Now obviously there'll be a whole other set of emotions coming up there if I'm not humble I'll start blaming my wife, feeling upset with her for not preparing the meal. Why she, knew, she didn't realise that I'm at work all day, you know, it's been a long day, long week. And we start to have some emotions towards her as well. Now, those emotions that come up in the times when you're tired, when you're frustrated and annoyed, are oftentimes what's really within us. They are sitting there dormant most of the time and yet we deny their existence most of the time. And it's only when we get uncomfortable that we start feeling them. Do you notice that? It's just when you feel discomfort that you start feeling those emotions. Now I would call those emotions still a part of your personal truth. There are things inside of you that are beautiful, and at the same time, because of the way we've grown up with a lot of different emotional injuries and so forth from our parents and our environment, there are also things inside of us that can be quite ugly at times. That's why people can murder, and that's why people can rape, because they have things inside of them that uh, are quite ugly, in terms of emotionally ugly, that they connect to at times, and then they express. And that's a part of the personal truth as well. What we are really. In uh, England, I, I don't know if you guys uh, know the Beatles well? Yeah. <laughs> well, in England, of course they know the Beatles well. So. And I, I just reminded them in England about the song, the Eleanor Rigby song. You know that song? No. That the lady wears a face that she keeps in a jar by the door. Yeah? And many of us do that, right? We go inside, we take off our clothes, take off our face, <laughs> right? and we act differently at home, and then before we go out the door, put on the face, and sometimes, for many of the ladies, you might actually put on a face too, like makeup and so forth, and go out 
outside again and, and act differently outside, and then come home, act differently when you're home to outside. That's not being in personal truth. Right? Personal truth is, if you can love personal truth, you can actually see yourself as you truly are. And this is a very powerful tool that you have at your disposal. You see, if you do not see yourself as you truly are, it's impossible to change. But if you can see yourself as you truly are, you have the ability to change. So it's a very powerful tool at your disposal, this idea of seeing personal truth, seeing yourself as you really are. Now, with truth, I feel there's these two parts of truth. This truth and this truth combined together is what will allow you to grow. But if you try to accept this truth without doing anything about this truth, you will grow for a little bit and then you will become stagnant. You will no longer grow. Or if you try to accept this without accepting this, you will grow for a little bit and also then become stagnant, because you're not conforming to the universal truth. There has to be a merging of these truths, where eventually I know the truth, the universal truth, and inside of me it's automatic for me to practice it, to, to use it in my life. <laughs> now, there are qualities of universal truth, and I do believe that one of the qualities of universal truth is that it's infinite. So therefore, we'll always be discovering it. There will always be new discoveries. Nobody can say, here's a book, like with the Bible, for example. Many religious people say, here's a book, and all the truth is in that. Now, that's physically impossible, isn't it? If the truth is infinite, this is not infinite. It's physically impossible for all the truth to be in this. Does that make sense? Of course. However, it's possible that some of the truth is in this, isn't it? Just like some of the truth could be in other holy books, for example, that have been created around the planet. Exactly the same principle. Because this is a finite book, it's only possible to have a finite amount of truth. Literally. Now, if we think of universal truth as infinite, and we think of our truth as what, as we're constantly learning about the, the universal truth, then you can see that we have to learn to grow and stretch and change. Because a person who's physically limited cannot absorb infinite truth. We need to grow so that we become bigger in the soul. And we'll talk about how that actually happens later. There has to be a way for it to happen. Otherwise, we can't absorb infinite truth. Right? But these two things are essential if you want to grow and change in your life all the time. And to me, they are essential for what I would call true spirituality, true development at the soul level. And it can only occur with these two particular qualities happening. In fact, I see humility as the doorway <coughs> into truth. So if I'm not completely humble, I have no way of absor absorbing new truth. So I am closed to new truth. I am basically saying no to new truth. If I am not humble, I am rejecting the possibility of new truth. Which is a very, I feel, stupid thing to do. Because if you do that, you're limiting yourself to your current development. You can't change if you do that. Now, but if I become open, humble, then it's like opening a doorway to be able to receive more truth. I now have the ability to absorb new things that I could not absorb before. And this is a very powerful way of changing. If I can't do that, I can't change. Yeah? So truth is also, I feel, a doorway into the third quality. <coughs> Now, I think many of you could probably guess what that would be. Love. Okay. What I see happening on the earth is that we are so fascinated 
with investigation of spiritual things that I put in quotations, you know, that we think are spiritual, but none of them include love. So we're investigating metaphysical things, things that happen in our universe, but none of them include love. I have a strong belief, and I'm not sure about how you feel about this, but I have a strong belief that love is in fact the primary quality of the universe itself. In other words, everything in the universe was created with a loving intent and has love behind it. Now, later you might like to ask some questions about that, because there, there are often people in the audience feel, but what about when somebody dies, like a child dies? Where's the love in that? Or what about when animals attack other animals? Where's the love in that? And there is actually, what I've discovered is there's love in every single thing, every single action, but you have to understand where it is. You have to understand the truth of it. That's all. And every single question you could ask, if you have love inside of you, you will know the answer very, very rapidly. And I'm talking not just about emotional questions, but rather scientific questions and other questions about the universe that surrounds us. Not, not just one or two questions about spirituality, but rather questions about our entire life. Now, there's two forms of love, which I'd like to discuss with you. So if we come across here, there's two forms of love. The first form of love that I'd like to talk about is what I call natural love. This is the love that you have inside of yourself that you can give to everything around you. It comes from within yourself. You have the ability to develop it or you have the ability to destroy it as well inside of yourself. Not completely destroyed, I believe, but it almost looks like it's completely destroyed from an external person watching. Now, this love, I would call the love that comes from within. So it's from within. It can be developed. In other words, it can grow. It can change. It can also be suppressed. And it can shrink. And therefore be as though, even though, as though it does not exist sometimes, it looks like, in some situations. This is the love that I believe is the seed of love that is being placed inside of every human. All of us have the ability to love and it can be developed and, and we can grow in love. This is the natural love that's within us. This love I feel is where many of us on earth are not in a space very, of very much of yet because we're still willing to go to war which tells us that we don't have much natural love as a human race. Because if we had natural love, we could not go to war. We would always have to find an alternative solution than war. Does that make sense? So natural love is something that we can develop, we can change within ourselves. And as a human race, it's very, very needed. Like we badly need to have more love on the planet. And uh, I feel a lot of us are waiting for somebody else to be more loving. <laughs> rather than us having to become more loving first. That's part of our problem. We're waiting for another person to become more loving rather than loving them first. That's natural love. Now, truth opens as a, is a doorway into that. How is that? How does that work? Well, truth, when we're truthful with ourselves in particular, we see where we're unloving. We see, wow, you know, t this morning, you know, I was driving along and I cut that person off. That wasn't a very loving thing. You know, they had the slam on their brakes, it was a bit slippery, they could have had a bad accident. I wasn't very loving in that space. Right? Now, if I'm humble, I will see my action and I'll go, whoa, there's an example of where I'm being unloving. And I'll look at the truth of that. I'll go, okay, why was I unloving? It was because I felt that my needs were more important than theirs. I felt that, you know, I needed to get to that little space that I put my car into, more than they did. So I thought in that moment that I was better than them or I wanted to be better than them in that moment. I wanted to be in front of them at that moment. 
these are all unloving feelings inside of me if I'm honest about them. I, if I have a humility, I can see. And then I, when, I, when I have a desire for personal truth, I see, yes, there's my unloving behaviour. And if I have a desire to love, I'd want to change. I'd want to find out why I do those kind of things all the time and fix them up so that I don't do them anymore. Can you see that? Okay, the second form of love, which I feel is the far more powerful of the two, is God's love, which I call and have called divine love. Now this love is not love that's within you. It comes from outside of you. It comes from the entity that I call God, the creator, your creator. It has the potential of entering you, but only if you desire that to occur. Only if you want that to happen. That's God's love, God's divine love. This love and this love both have the potential to change people around you and change yourself. So I don't know if you've noticed that. Have you noticed that when you show love to somebody, when you show compassion or understanding and kindness to somebody, it's like sometimes they change. Have you noticed that? Like, have you noticed when other people show you that, you feel different? Like you, it's almost like you want to change. It gives you a, a momentum to change as well. That's the power of love. Even in our relationships, like how many of you like to have a relationship without love? It feels pretty bland and ordinary, and oftentimes it doesn't last very long. Isn't that the, that the case? But if there's love there, love is this binding force that can change us for years and years and years. In the first century, I was asked, "What are the two main things that two main commandments that you can give us?" And I said, the first one is you must love God with your whole heart, your whole soul, and your whole mind, and your, all of your strength. So this is relating to the first one, God's love, and the love you have for God. And then I said, and the second one is this, you must love your neighbour as yourself. So that's the second one, this natural love, developing the natural love. So they are the primary principles of what myself and Mary have been teaching all around the world. Does that make sense? Now, of course, this is a very, very short introduction to a very complicated subject. Do you understand? So obviously there are many, many more things that we can discuss within, within this. But if you can see that these are the primary principles, then we've got somewhere we can move from. So the aspect of humility, very, very important. Because it opens your heart to truth. The aspect of truth is very, very important because it's a doorway into discovering more about love. And love is what changes the universe, but it also is what the universe operates upon. So the more you can learn about the love, the better off your life is going to be. Not only your life, but the life of everyone around you as well. Now, if you think about it, the majority of spirituality that we see on the planet, or the majority of almost any form of investigations that we see on the planet have one of these things missing, generally. And quite often it's quite blatantly missing. Have you noticed that? So let's go back to Christianity as a, as a belief system. Most Christians believe that this is the complete, the Bible is the complete written word of God. You, they believe that you do not need anything else. There is no other truth that you can present. Isn't that what most of them believe? You ask almost any Christian from any denomination, and they basically will generally say that. Right? They might not personally believe that, of course, but generally they say that. Now, I put to you that that's not humility. Because humility is to be open to all forms of new truth. And if I'm saying that this is the limited, this is the truth and there is no other, then I'm no longer being humble, am I? I'm no longer open to receiving new truth. I'm no longer open to receiving even more truth about myself. So that one statement is proof 
that true spirituality, humility, does not exist. It's just a way of life or a way of thinking. It's instead of this, so I call all of this true spirituality, instead of that, it is just a facade. And in fact, I feel it's a lie. Because you're making statements often, we're making statements often where one particular thing is said to be true, but the reality is that if it doesn't have these three things in it, it cannot be true. It's as simple as that. It cannot be. And if you can measure everything using those basic principles, and you don't have to be a member of a religion or any other way of life to do that, you can measure these things based on these principles, then you can look at different forms of religious thought, you can look at different forms of scientific thought, you can look at different forms of political thought, you can look at different forms of medical thought, and so forth and so forth, and every single one of them has either love or no love in it, or partial love in it. Every single one of them has truth or no truth or partial truth in it, and very few of them have any humility. Because many Christians, they are so uh, afraid of the negative power of the evil forces. That's why they are so concentrated on the Bible and what it says, isn't yep. it? I agree. It's the, it's the fear yep. making it. Or it, what is it? I agree. Can I just point out, though, that your action was one, one that was unloving? Pardon? You, were, you just had an unloving action yourself. It's a beautiful question. But you could have put your hand up. Well, I didn't. I didn't see it, and and you could have moved it so that I could. Does that make sense? Sorry. But it's still unloving to interject. Right. So, but let's answer the question. So you're dead right. Fear is the main reason why we become. We have a lack of humility or we want, don't want to look at truth, or we don't want to be more loving. Fear is the main reason. So the fear you had was that I wouldn't see you, and so you had to interject. That was a fear. Does that make sense? That fear drove your action, and that, and that action was then an interjection straight away, an unloving action caused by a fear within. Now, what you, the comment, ironically, that you make about Christianity, you actually displayed yourself in exactly the same moment, which is the, which is what we often do, I'm not picking on you, it's what we often do, right? You see, it's sort of like, we notice other people do, oh, there's the Christians, look at what they do. You see, that they have all this fear in them, fear, like you say, about evil forces, like the Satan and the demons, in other words, they would call it, and all this fear... Anything that comes along that's a, that, that seems contrary in any way to what's in here, they go, it's the demons, the Satan's behind it. And now this fear is a way of controlling people, but also it's a way of shutting down humility, shutting down truth and shutting down love. So they also feel that they don't have to be loving in that space. So when Satan's behind something, now I can be angry and firm about Satan being behind it, you see? And that's where they go. They go into this space of no longer being loving in the situation. And fear is the primary dominant factor of that. Yes, I agree completely. Fear is a, is a terrible emotion, actually. It has far more power on the planet than all of us realise, in fact. You think about, even in your own day-to-day -day life, how much fear dominates your decision-making. For example... How many of you are doing a job, the exact job that you love right now? Yeah, just a couple of us. The exact job that we love. We love going, we, we just get up every morning feeling passionate to go to work and, uh, and we stay there because we're just passionate doing it. Now, why would we not have a job like that? Most of the time it's because of fear. Because we know we need to get money to live, we need to pay the bills, we need to pay the utilities or the electricity, the gas, we need to pay our vehicle expenses and all those things. And if we don't have a job that pays all that, we start getting very afraid. 
And so many of us then make what's called a compromise. We compromise love of ourselves for the sake of our fear. And why would we do that? It's because we don't humble enough to feel our fear. We don't want to feel our fear. We want to make our fear go away. And the way we make our fear go away is by compromising and doing some things so the fear goes less and then we go, oh, I can breathe again, I feel better now. <coughs> now if we were really humble, we'd go, no, 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 we cannot live in a, in a place where we don't love ourselves. And so I would have to make changes in my life if I wasn't in a job. So basically what many of you have just admitted is that you need to make changes in your life about your job. And then many of us go, well, I don't, I don't even know what I would like to do. You see, many of us have had our desires suppressed for so long <coughs> since we were little children that we grow up thinking that what we're doing is what we want when it's really not. And we, we don't really know what we want. We've got no idea, many of us. Now, why would that situation occur? It's because we're not humble enough to feel, I don't know what I want. So what we start to do when we're not humble enough to feel that feeling is we start listening to what other people think we should do. So we have mum and dad tell us what we think we should do, our friends tell us what we think they think we should do, and so eventually we listen to all of that and we go, yeah, that's the kind of things that we should do. So let's go ahead and do that. And it's not really what we want. I was wondering why, why, why do you think it's so complicated for us to actually learn all the things about what you're talking about? I think fear is the main thing actually that makes it complicated. Yeah. Um, you, see, you see, every time anybody makes a statement to us, it's almost like any statement triggers a level of fear within us. And so the fear has become so dominant that we then go, no, oh, I can't hear that, or I can't do that. So if I said to you t today, tomorrow, uh, no, tomorrow's Sunday, isn't it? Do you, you don't work in Sweden Sundays, generally? No. Monday. Most of you work Monday? Yes. Well, Monday, most of you need to go into work and resign. That's the reality, because you're not living in a job that you would really like to do. Now, when I say that, what do most of you feel? Like the feeling that most would have is, what? I don't want to resign. Like If I resign, I've got nowhere to go. I won't know what to do. I'll have all these problems, all the bills to pay. You know, and straight away, the fear's in place. And the fear prevents the action. The and the fear is preventing us from actually taking steps in the future. So, uh, so in other words, it's preventing us from change. It's preventing us from actually changing our life. Now, when I first, uh, I, I used to do property development, right? And before then I used to be a computer programmer and consultant. So for nearly 20 years I had this business, I would work about, <coughs> on the average, on my computer business, I would work around anywhere from 12 to 15 hours a day generally, and I'd usually work around 100 hours a week on the average. There'd been some times in my computer business where I would work for four days straight without any sleep. That's how much I would work. So, a lot. <laughs> Did you think I liked the job? <laughs> of course not. I didn't like the job at all. But it brought lots of money. Right? So, it brought me so much money that I'm, I was able to begin buying properties. And then after a while I liked properties because I found that I could make money faster buying properties and selling properties. So, what I did was I started doing that. But I didn't give up the computer business. So now I was doing both businesses at the same time. And eventually I had four companies that I was running doing those, business, those businesses. Now all the time, myself getting compromised, I was getting sick quite regularly, as you can imagine, and uh, feeling quite low a lot of the times as well. But I was working, 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 staying in this cycle, if you like. Now, how myself and Mary live our life now is that we don't earn anything, any money at all. We just rely on people donating to us if they want to, and we don't even ask them to donate. So all we do is we have a little, is there, a, I don't even know if there is a box up the back, is there one? 
for this one. So somebody's done that for us, thank you very much. <laughs> but, but a lot of times, there's a box up the back or whatever, and we have just an internet thing saying how people can donate. And initially, when we started giving these talks, when I started doing these talks, for five years, I received no donations. Five years. Now, of course, during that time I had to sell a lot of my property <laughs> to pay for what I was doing. You know, travelling around the world, speaking to groups of people and so forth. Didn't receive any donations to do it, so the money had to come from somewhere. So eventually I spent all my money. And when I met Mary, um, four years ago or so, I had no money. So she thought that was a pretty good thing. And, uh, <laughs> Not really. <laughs> and, uh, and I had to look at why I was not receiving donations. I had to look at why people weren't appreciating what I was doing and, uh, and didn't have a feeling of appreciation. So I had to go through that emotionally. Now that was quite a fear time for me, but because no money, nothing coming in, but I still wanted to do this, this work. I didn't want to do, I, I closed down my computer business as soon as I I did what I'm suggesting to you to do Monday, is on one day I made the decision to close all of my companies and stop my work. I had one commitment that I had to follow through on with one company that I'd said yes to doing. When I finished that commitment, the whole lot stopped. I had lots of very upset clients <laughs> who were upset with me because I was stopping doing the work that I'd done for them for years and years. And, uh, and I just said, no, I've got to embrace what I feel, you know, what my soul feels to do. So I stopped all of that. And so now we have, I have no money and, um, and we have a, um, I, I'm doing talks and often there's 50 to 100, sometimes two or 300 people listening to the talk. And uh, I've got no sound system either. So I've got no money to buy the sound system either. So, um, so, so I decide the best thing to do is to go out and buy a sound system on my credit card. So that, that was my decision when I had no money to go and do that. Because it's still in my passion and still in my desire and then I had to work my way through why I was attracting no money. And it was pretty confronting for me emotionally. I had to work through quite a number of things. I won't go into all the things but I had to work through quite a lot of things. It took me a little while and then after a while we received a few hundred dollars out of at one of these presentations and uh, not enough to get there not enough to get home <laughs> and but still living off the credit card a bit to pay for those things and then eventually um, once I worked my way through some more emotions eventually we got enough money to live on but no money to buy any sound systems or any other thing any new thing and then I had to work through more of the reason why my soul was blocking all of that and once I'd done that, then people donated enough funds for us to buy new sound systems, buy cameras, and things like that. But it all come from donations of people all around the world. Yeah. But if I had not embraced it because I was too afraid, none of that would have happened. If I was too afraid, I'd still be doing my computer business right now. <coughs> I'd still be doing it right now because I'd be too afraid to act. And this is the problem that we have, is that we're not prepared to be humble and feel everything through the process. And we are afraid to do so. We're afraid of what the consequences are going to be. Fear is a huge, huge impediment to our growth. Now, can you see that, what's the opposite to fear, do you think? Is there any opposite to fear? Courage. Courage is an excellent quality. Trust. 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 Love. Love. Belief. There's, True. You know what I feel the opposite of fear is now? Desire. Not so much the opposite of fear, but it negates fear to a large degree, is what I've found. Without desire, I actually feel fear is the opposite to truth, by the way. But, but without desire, you will never discover what the truth is. That's what I've found. And without desire, you will never overcome your fear. You see? It's a bit like if you're sitting in a job right now and that you don't like, and you want to shift from that job to another job, 
It's only when the desire to move is greater than the fear you have that you'll actually move. Can you see that? It's only when the desire is bigger than the fear. If the desire is smaller than the fear, what will happen? You will stay until such time as the pain of staying is so much that it moves you into having more desire than you have fear. And then you will go. That's how it works. So I actually feel while truth is, is the antidote to fear, desire is a great way of moving through your fears. And if you think about it, desire is a quality associated with love, isn't it? Can you see that? And so, so because desire is associated with love, it's a very powerful quality that we need to develop in ourselves. To learn to have desire. Learn to have passion for things. Very powerful quality of desire. It can lead you through all of your fears. It, you, you see, a lot of, what a lot of people believe is that they have to lower their fear before they do anything. I don't agree with that at all. I've found no other way of lowering fear than having a greater desire. Right? Because a lot of times what I, what I did in my life is I had fear, was there, desire was here, and so I'd stay stuck, 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 stuck all of my life until the pain of that increased my desire to make a change. Once my desire made a change, I didn't care how much I was afraid, I still made the change. I was still afraid and I had to feel my fears. Right? And once I feel my fear, now I can actually flow into that life quite easily if I'm willing to feel my fear. What's a willingness to feel your fear? That's humility. The quality of humility allows you to be willing to feel that you're afraid. You see, many of us are not even willing to feel that. We're not even willing to admit we're afraid. Isn't that the truth? Christine? Yeah. Ask, is the only way to increase desire by experiencing slower, more pain? pain or no. It's like, a good question. Yeah. yeah. So Christine is asking, is the only way to improve my desire to feel pain until my pain gets above the threshold that I'm willing to bear and then I have some desire? No. We could choose to develop desire, just like you can choose to develop any other quality within yourself. The problem for most of us is we don't develop desire. We only wait until the pain is greater and then we do something. But if we learnt to develop desire, learnt to live in our passions and our desires, now we, we can move before we feel pain. Now we can change before there's a painful situation. So for, I see this happening a lot in relationships, you know, how many relationships become very stagnant because one or both parties in the relationship don't want to change. Right? Now, if you're a part, in a relationship that does want, you, you, yourself, want to change, and your partner does not wish to change, and they've been very firm with you about that, and they're telling you, no, I am definitely not changing. Now, can you see this is a very, very difficult relationship now, isn't it? Because you're desiring change, your partner's desiring to be stagnant. Now, what do you do? Now, the majority of people are willing to stay in that situation for a very, very long time. Some willing to stay in that situation all of their lives, and they die in that situation. Right? Now, my suggestion is, okay, you, there's such a thing as a temporary, temporary separation. <laughs> you might still love the person, but if the person is holding you back in any way, right? then it's important that you make a change and that you have some desire. Now, now, if you wait for a long period of time in that relationship, can you see how the pain will just build, 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 and eventually you're starting now to have arguments, starting to have disagreements that... You, and if you stay in the pain of that, you could even stay in the arguments until such a time as you become violent with each other even, and some do. You know, they start throwing plates and saucers at each other and, and eventually some even kill each other. 
or one kills the other in that situation. That is an indication where the pain had to be so great before somebody actually did anything. Yeah? My suggestion is never wait for the pain to be the main motivator for you to do anything. Develop desire instead, and then pain will no longer be the main thing that causes problems. Does that make sense? Yeah. Okay, so how are we with the basics here? Everyone's fine with that? I didn't understand. Do you need desire to leave this path? Yes, well, um, in the situation I just gave, like if the pain of the situation is that I'm stagnant, I'm stagnant, nothing's changing in my relationship, then have a temporary separation and make a change. Have a desire to grow and make a change. Now, it doesn't mean that you leave the person permanently because you, you may still love them and you may still want the things for them. But, but they need to be making up their own mind as to what they want uh, in terms of how they change. I need to still embrace change. I need to embrace love of myself. And so choose, choose to leave temporarily and address all the fears that come up when I do. Because for a lot of us, fears of security, safety, you know, we're worried that we're now going to have to maybe um, have more work. We're worried about where we're going to live. We have all these fears come up. That's why people don't leave. That's why they stay. And my suggestion is to let your desire drive you and, and feel all of those fears. Let yourself work through all those fears. And a lot of times when you do, you realise how much you've been demanding of the other person. How much you've been expecting them to do things for you. How much you've been expecting them to work for you or to clean up after you or to... Or, or to you know, make your meals for you and so forth. And you, you actually learn a lot through that process, which is always good because remember, humility, truth and love always cause you to learn. They always cause you to grow. And then down the track, you may work out that you still love the person and you just wait for them to decide to change. But you can still have your life doing other things and still be happy and you're not in pain all the time. Not in personal pain all the time. Yeah. Yep. So that's my recommendation in that situation. Yeah. Yeah. Is there any other questions about this at all? It raises a lot of issues, this. Yes. Uh, how can you let grow desire? Just by focusing on what you want uh, daily? Uh... Yes, but uh, desire has to come from your heart, not your head. You think about that. Um, Desire, like every other emotion, has to come from some motivating force within you. You see, you can think, I want to have something, but if, if it's only a thought, it's not going to be present with you all the time. It's only when it's a passion inside of your heart that it now becomes present with you in every moment. So I pull that, let's just uh, rub a bit of this off. It's cool. Let's talk about desire a little bit because it's a very important part of overcoming your fear. So let's talk about desire. Remember, desire is the way to... You still have fear, but you're overcoming it. You still have it. You're going to feel your fear still. Whatever you choose to do, whatever you desire to do, you're still going to feel your fear and do it anyway. But desire causes you to overcome the blocking action of fear. Fear causes you to stagnate, desire causes you to overcome your stagnation and, and grow. So, so when we look at desire, how do we develop it? It can't be, it's not in the head. Not in the mind. So, with some things, no matter how often you think of them, you won't have a desire for them. Like, for example, how many of you have a strong desire to clean up a latrine? Not many of you? Now, no matter how long you think about that desire, growing that desire, do you think you could think about that for a year? Would you still have a desire to clean up the latrine? Probably not. All right, so there are some things, obviously, that growing a desire to do are a bit more difficult. So what, how would I grow a desire to clean up a latrine? Well, if I'm a man who uses that latrine, 
and I go in there after a year of it never being cleaned, it would be quite smelly, right? And the smell would get so intense that eventually I say, someone has to clean up this latrine. <laughs> and if I'm the only user of the latrine, there's a high likelihood that someone will be me under those circumstances, yes? But uh, if I had a love of my environment, can you see I wouldn't have waited that long. If I loved my care of myself, I'd go in there and as soon as there's a whiff of an odour, I would be wanting to clean it up. So I could grow my desire for personal cleanliness, which would immediately motivate me to some action, even if something is unpleasant to do. Right? Now, how do we grow desire then? It has to be so it has to be a feeling to do it, doesn't it? We've got to have a feeling to do it. Or if, if I use another term, I don't know, um, some languages don't translate things properly so in the sense of the right feeling. So let's use the term longing. When I desire something, I long for something. Do you understand what I mean by that? Have a strong feeling for it. I want it really badly. Here. Huh? Now, I can start off with anything, with no desire at all. The very first day you met your current partner, did you have a longing for them? Now, some of, some of you may have a feeling of it, love at first sight, but very few people generally have that. Right? Often we don't have that feeling at all. So how did it get from you not knowing the person to you wanting to live with them. How did that happen? Any ideas how that happened? <laughs> it's a gradual process. It's a gradual process, right? So yes. Any any others? It's gradual. Why was it gradual? Chemistry. Chemistry, somebody said? Chemistry? <laughs> but, but see, initially sometimes there is no chemistry. Some of you have even looked at the person and gone, I don't like them very much. <laughs> the very first time you met them, right? And then later, later, they seem to just grow on you somehow. <laughs> and then after a while, you find, found out what? what? What happens with gradual, what happens over this gradual period? What is, what is happening? You're getting to, you're getting to know them. Huh? See? Can you see? You're getting to know the truth about this person. You see, if you weren't open to the discovery of the truth about that person through a process, you would have never got to know them. And once you started to get in, getting to know them, there are things that you then found more attractive. More attractive than other people that you found in other people. Right? And that caused your desire to get to know them to grow even further. Does that make sense? And then, then you got to know more about them and eventually your desire to got to know them was so big that now you wanted to make love to them. Right? And then you went through this whole process of, getting, of making love to them and you enjoy that so much that your desire to be with them all the time grew to the point where you wanted to either marry or live together or something. Isn't that what happened? The process? The process began with no desire and yet ended up with so much desire that you want to spend the rest of your life with them. So isn't that proof that desire grows? You can grow desire. And how do you grow desire? By getting to know things. By, by Knowledge by opening yourself up to the truth about the interaction with the thing or person. Now, of course, a lot of desire is dependent on getting to know the truth about yourself. Right? Now, the reason why many of us don't have desire is because we have shut down, or our parents in particular have shut down, much of the truth about ourselves. And so what we finish up doing is we finish up no longer desiring the truth about ourselves. 
And if you don't desire the truth about yourself, you will never come to love yourself. So that's a problem if we want to live in harmony with these three things. So as we desire to get to know ourselves, we start accepting how we feel. And it's the same with another person when we desire to get to know them. We start accepting how they feel. So we sit down and instead of talking about, oh, this is a lovely cup of tea or you hear a lot of coffee drinkers, yes? <laughs> So this is a lovely cup of coffee, we sit over a cup cake and we talk about the weather and the politics and the religion and the, and the eco economy and so forth. We're actually now having more personal interactions where we find out what's your name and what's, but where did that come from? What was your background? How did you grow up? Where did you, what are your family like? And we start discovering the truth about everything. As we discover the truth, our desire to interact with the person grows. This is what happens naturally. Yes? So, so the way to grow desire is to be open to the discovery of truth about things. So, how do I know I have a desire for mathematics? How many of you have a desire for mathematics? Very few. <laughs> I think it was four people. <laughs> Including myself. <laughs> now, why, why do you feel most of us don't have a desire for mathematics? What happened during our school years with mathematics? You weren't that good at it. We weren't that good at it, many of us. And so what happened when we weren't that good at it? Did somebody come along and give you extra tuition when you weren't that good at it? Sometimes they did, but most of the time they didn't. What did they do instead? They... Katarina? Um, the best he yelled at us. Right, so many of you got yelled at. Some of you, even at school, and, and when I went to school, got screamed at <laughs> by the frustrated teacher, right? They even screamed at. Now, of course, that's a pretty fried thing, a fearful thing. You're a young child just learning something, and when you didn't get it, somebody's now yelling at you or screaming at you or, or, or belittling you in front of the whole class. So now what do we have? We have a heap of emotions that cause us to, whenever we think of mathematics, instead of thinking of mathematics, oh, it's fantastic, it's beautiful, there's so many interesting, when we think mathematics, what do most of us finish up thinking? Horrible, Horrible terrible, afraid. <laughs> and all these other emotions come up because we've been treated badly in the absorption of that particular area of expertise. Now imagine if all of us had not had that background. What would happen? Fair. They also told me I'm not smart enough. Yes, yeah. So, so when, when I wasn't doing my maths correctly, you're an idiot, you're stupid, you can't understand basic principles, there's something wrong with you. And for many of us, whenever we think of mathematics, we think there's something wrong with me. There's an automatic association between those two things. So, so when, I, when I talk about mathematics and how wonderful it is, the most, most people in an audience go, what? It's not wonderful. It's terrible. And the reality is, for the majority of us, we've had a terrible experience with mathematics. All through our lives, we've had a terrible experience with mathematics. And it's only when we, for the, generally the engineers or the scientists, they didn't have a terrible experience with mathematics generally and so they became engineers and scientists for that reason but but for those of the rest of us we've had a terrible experience with it a terrible emotional experience every time we think about it we're still some of us are 60 or 70 years of age and every time we think about it we just shudder still and we're 70 or 60. that's how much of a terrible experience it was it's been carried with us the rest of our lives so, can you see the desire to know now is shut down completely because of the experience. So, what we need to be concerned of with desire is if we have no desire for natural things, for things that are present in our universe, and mass is present in our universe, science is present in our universe, language is present in our universe, Right? All of these things, literature is present in our universe, all these things are present in our universe. If we don't have a desire for any one of them, then it's usually because we have emotional feelings from our childhood associated with 
those particular things that have shut down desire. So part of learning about desire is to release our fears associated with the particular thing. Now how do we release a fear? By actually doing it rather than just fearing it. So, have any of you been along to a symphony orchestra recently? Yeah? How many? Some of you? How many of you, when you think of a symphony orchestra playing classical music, you just shudder? How many of you feel that way? No one? Sometimes. Sometimes. <laughs> um, so most of us have an attraction to music, yes? Would that not be true? All forms of music, would that not be true? How many of you love rock? Rock? How many of you love grunge or you know, hard, heavy metal? Um, all those kind of... How many of you love, like, what do they call Emo? Emo? What's it they're called? What would it be called here? Jazz. Jazz. Um, so, so many of us are putting up our hands for each one. <laughs> Why is that? Because many of us have very little emotional impediments with music. We are often fascinated with music. Music brings us a lot of joy. And we were very rarely attacked over music in our childhood. Can you see that? In fact, what happened with our parents? They played the music, you know, on the radio. They played the music, usually when we were growing up. So we have very little emotional impediment to that. So can you see, when we have very little emotional resistance or fear, we are automatically in more desire. So that tells me that these two emotions are very closely linked with each other. If we wish to grow, desire needs to grow, but we can affect desire two ways. One is by actually getting to know the subject, and that helps alleviate or reduce the fear associated with the subject. Then desire can naturally grow. If we can feel the fear associated with the subject, we also have the ability to grow our desire. Does that make sense? Does that answer the question? Okay, is there any other questions about that? No? So, if we get back to the discussion about what's real spirituality, can you see that to me, real spirituality is very practical? See, I find in the world today that people are becoming more and more addicted to the mysterious. Have you noticed that? Yeah, anything that's mystery is fascinating. Yeah. And they'll even fancify the fascinating. Like, in other words, they make it so... Like, I, I was listening last night to a television... I just turned on the television for five minutes last night. A show was about the Bermuda Triangle. You've heard of that location on the earth? Where there's a seemingly a lot of mysterious things that have happened. And the man, instead of just saying, oh, this mysterious thing happened, or that mysterious thing's happened, or that mysterious thing's happened, this is what he was doing instead. This very big mystery has happened. And this, you know, there was this, the, the whole mood wasn't one of the discovery of truth, but the addiction to the mystery. One, you know, wanting to have the feeling of the mystery in the of the presentation. You see, I feel that is what fancifies things. And unfortunately, when we fancify things, we automatically, I feel, create resistance to one of these things. But there is the same answer that God's mysterious. Yeah, and I, I don't believe that either. No. I don't believe God's but mysterious. Yeah, there is a big saying like that. And I feel that there is this deep beliefs in the human race that uh, God is mysterious, so, so therefore everything is mysterious, so therefore we'll never find out really the truth about anything. So what's the point of even looking? <laughs> That's where we even go with that. Uh, when you communicate or ask questions, could you please speak louder so we could be... The, sure, the yeah, good, good comment. So if, if we can speak loud, if we're out the front and asking questions, speak loud enough for the people down the back to hear it. So the question was, or the statement was... Oh, God's ways are mysterious. Yes, yeah. so there's this belief in, in the world that God's ways are all mysterious. And I don't agree with such, such, such a thing at all. Oh. 
Yep. Yep. Um, Simon? Thank you. Yeah, and as well as that, we should not know. We should not know. We should not know. No, about truth and about. Yes. And it's not logical. Yes. How, how many of you have heard of this doctrine in Christianity called the Trinity? Mm. Mm -hmm. Yeah? Mm -hmm. Any of you have heard of that? Yeah? Most of you? <coughs> it's a conundrum, isn't it? To understand. And, and in fact, that's one reason why they created the doctrine. So that it would be a conundrum to understand. And so that thousands of theses could be written about it and still nobody really understand it. But we could then say that God is mysterious and all of God's ways are mysterious. And so we don't really have to understand it. We have to have faith in it. Now I put to you that faith is not understanding the... Un the, the, the um, what's the word I'm looking for? The non-understandable. The, the, does that make sense? To me, faith comes from proof, evidence. To have faith in something, you've got to have some kind of evidence that such a thing exists or is able to exist. Do, do you follow me? Now, to me, um, teachings that are illogical are definitely never true. Because, it, because logic is something that God gave us in our mind to utilise and use. It does not make sense that we have to throw out logic to understand something. Right? That does not make sense at all. And in fact, if you think of every scientific discovery we've ever made, there is always logic in it, somewhere. So to me that indicates that if there's no logic in a spiritual form of uh, discussion or, or a spiritual idea or a belief system, then it's most probably not true. There needs to be logic involved with it. Yeah. So, and this quality of faith, I feel that it is an important quality, but we need to have it based on what I would classify as evidence. Can I give you an example? Um, a couple of hundred years ago, and for many of the thousand years before then, mankind knew that flight was possible. Now, how did they know? Because birds could do it. That's how they knew that it must be possible. And for many thousands of years, people have tried to discover how this flight thing could be possible. Yes? And so they come up with all different theories, some of which they tried to scientifically put into action. And of course, many people died through this process because their ways of doing it didn't work so well, didn't operate well. But there was still evidence that flight was possible. Can you see? And so that kept humanity keeping on searching, keeping on searching for the truth about flight, yes? So they kept on searching the truth about flight. So there's evidence present. Now because the evidence was present and man kept searching for the truth and they were humble enough to see their mistakes, you know, so that they try one thing, you know, strapping a few feathers to the arms and flap, flap, flap and crash uh, I'm humble to the fact that that didn't work. Now, right? I know that didn't work. I'm humble enough to accept my mistakes. Now I have the ability to discover more truth. And eventually we get to a point where somebody discovers this. Or probably drawn more accurately, this. Yes? A shape that we now have in every aeroplane that we fly on every day. And in that process they discovered something. They discovered that if you push that forward, <coughs> right, what happens is the air flows and the air flows there and the air over the top expands so it gets thinner. Whereas the air underneath compresses or stays the same. That's what they found. This is the discovery 
of what you now know as aerodynamics. Yes? So in this process, they realized that that then created what was called lift. Yes? Now, the very first people who understood that properly could now build something that actually could fly. And all they had to worry about was trying to get the thing to move forward. Now, initially, they tried getting the thing to move forward by jumping off of a hill. And it moved forward, but only moved forward until they hit the bottom of the hill. And then, of course, we had a problem. So, so what they decided then was to add the motor and a propeller to the entire design. And that then created forward movement, which then created lift enough to get off the ground. Yes? Okay. Now, I put to you that that discovery of those truths required humility on the part of every single person involved with the discovery of that truth. They had to be willing to experiment, they had to be willing to change their ideas, they had to be willing to grow. It required, at the end, to accept that there was an absolute truth about flight. The absolute truth was the law of aerodynamics. That was the absolute truth about flight. Now, I also feel that there are many other truths about levitation and movement of, of other things that we're yet to discover. But we've discovered this one, the truth about flight, which is all about the law of aerodynamics. And we call it the law of aerodynamics because it's a fixed truth. It's an absolute truth. You know the law of gravity. That's also an absolute truth. It's a gravitational pull on each one of us that if it didn't exist, we'd all be out in the universe very rapidly, yes? The Earth is spinning at about 1,800 or whatever it is, kilometres per hour. And uh, if we had no gravity, at 1,800 kilometres an hour, we'd be flung out into space. Yeah. But gravity keeps us here. Again, we discovered we were in the truth, but eventually it was discovered, this truth. It was a discovery of the law that was involved. So every truth, I feel, has a law associated with it. There are physical laws, there are spiritual laws, there are soul-based laws. They are all laws that all have are associated with the truth. So, the, what I was getting at was that there is evidence associated with the discovery that we could have faith that flight existed. We had faith because we could see birds flying. That caused us to have faith, and that faith caused many, many people to be involved in the discovery of this law. The law of aerodynamics which creates lift. Yes. So faith is a very, very important quality to develop, to actually grow and change. For us as a human race, to grow and change, we need faith. But we need to have evidence that it's worth having faith in a certain direction. <clears throat> you see? It's no good having faith in something that is illogical and there's no evidence to support its existence. It's pointless having faith in that. And this is where I feel many spiritual <clears throat> paths go astray. We put our faith in things that there is no firm evidence for. And this is where we cause ourselves a lot of pain. Because we start believing things with there being no evidence. Or little evidence. <coughs> to have faith, you have to have the understanding also. To have faith, you have to have some understanding. I agree. Yeah, I agree totally. So, for instance, we had faith in flight because we could actually see birds flying. So we knew that they were capable of flying somehow, we just had to discover how. Now, initially, the people who started investigating thought that they were lighter than air. But that's not true, we found out. You start weighing a bird, you realise that it's not lighter than air, it's heavier than air. So, so after a while, we started getting rid of the theories, and we ended up with the truth. By investigation, but we need to certainly come to an understanding. Very important part of gaining evidence. Yeah. 
Okay. So, my suggestion is, any form of spirituality, any form of investigation that causes you to attempt to believe the unbelievable, the illogic, the illogical, can't probably be associated with truth. But we've got to be careful, because sometimes what we think is illogical is not illogical. So we've still got to be humble and open. Yeah? That's my question. Um, because often I find that I'm not very logical mm -hmm. <laughs> because of the emotions that I have from my childhood. Like maths to me doesn't feel logical mm -hmm. because of my experience of it as a child. Exactly. So it seems to me I have to have humility to discover what is logical. What is logical. Yeah. Yeah. And then the question of faith becomes... Don't I then have faith in those three principles? That they will lead me... Yes, if you God? have faith in these three principles, that they will lead you to the discovery of all things, then you can always find truth in every, the truth of everything. Yeah. Yes, yeah. And, and connection with God. Yeah. Whereas if I say it must be logical for me to have faith in it, then it seems to me I limit myself Yes. Because I must be humble to, I don't perhaps understand everything that is logical. Yeah. Yes. So let's talk about logic a bit more in detail. The problem with logic is that many times we think we're being logical when we're not. So that's a problem. So, so for example, if I say to you, on Monday, the majority of you who, said, who didn't put up your hand and said you were in a job that you really, really loved, you should leave your job Monday. Now, for the majority of us, that doesn't feel like a logical decision. Does that make sense? The reason why is because <coughs> if I leave my job on Monday, then Tuesday the bill comes and I, I don't have anything to pay the bill. And then I might be out of the house, I might be out of, you know, I no longer have my car, I get repossessed, and I have all of these, what do you call repossession here? Is it the same thing? When something's taken off of you because you cannot pay it. <coughs> What's that called here? What's it called? <laughs> and what does that mean in English? <laughs> Repossession. <laughs> no worries. <laughs> okay, so 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 I get all these things repossessed from me because I don't. So so from a logic, what seems to be logic, I'm going. No, no, I can't do that. That's an illogical decision. But see, for me, I've learned that. Our fears don't activate the laws of love or truth or humility very much. So I've learnt that if I do things in harmony with any one of these things, that I will always grow and I'll always change and I'll always be looked after. That's what I've learnt. But if you haven't learnt that right from the time of your childhood generally, which most of us haven't, then it, it feels illogical to make a choice that's based on our desire. But what I'm saying is that all of God's laws are all logical, and in, but not necessarily appearing logical to us. Can you see the difference? So some things don't appear logical to us, to appear logic to us, because of, as Mary pointed out, emotions. And particularly the emotion of fear. <coughs> What I've found myself is that fear causes us to become very <coughs> illogical. Right? And this is something we do need to address. If the more fear I have, the more illogical I think. <coughs> but I think I'm being logical at the same time. Because my fear is telling me what it, what it believes is true. So I often refer to fear as false expectations appearing real. It's the false <coughs> appearing true. Does that make sense? And the problem for many of us is that the false does appear true. Because we live in a world where the false appears true. And we have to work our way through that. That's not the same as truth, because remember I talked about truth being God's truth, what is really true. 
What I've personally found is that God's truth is God cares for each single person with all of her heart and therefore cares about every single thing that you do, say, think and feel and cares about your life and cares about whether you live, die or are happy or not. That's what I have found. But when we say that, most people go, but what about the logic of this happening around the world and this happening around the world? And I can explain anything that's happening around the world through that belief, if you want to hear it. But, but oftentimes, our fear dominates our logic, and so we start thinking that what is logical is what is fear-based. So we start believing everything we are afraid of. We feel that our fear is real. And it's not. It's just an emotion. But we believe it's real. And what I find in the average person's life is that they believe their fear is real so much that they live their life through their fear because they feel that it is real. They feel they can do no other thing. And that will need to be challenged if you want to be happy. Yeah, I experience that uh, people become the logical when they are really hard in their heart. When they just finish a love relation and they have a broken heart. Or, so when they are with a broken heart and I talk with them, it's like they lost their mind. <laughs> yeah, yes, they, I agree. <laughs> yes. And so what is happening there? There it is a lack of humility. In other words, they don't want to feel the truth, but they want to feel their own truth. So for example, when a person leaves a partner, they feel that that partner, that, that, is, that leaving the partner is the end of their life, many times. Now that's not very logical, considering they're still alive. It's not very logical. But that's what we believe that it's the end of my life, it's the end of my existence as I know it, it's terrible, it's the worst thing that could happen to me, and so forth, and it's obviously not uh, necessarily the worst thing that could happen to us, but we believe that to be so, because we're afraid to feel alone, we're afraid to feel a number of other emotions, and often it's our lack of humility, our lack of our ability to feel our fears, that causes us to believe things that are false. People must be careful about their thoughts when their heart is hearted for a while until the heart is better, it's getting better, and whole. Yes, in other words, they need to be careful acting upon their fear based thoughts. Right? Do you understand what I mean by that? So, so we often, with our emotions, we often have great levels of, let's write some down at our emotions, we often inside of us have grief. And then often inside of us we have a fears of our grief. We are afraid that we cannot feel certain things. For, for many of us, to feel the emotion of being alone is so terrifying <coughs> that we construct all of our life so we're never alone. Like quite often I've seen people go from one relationship and then within a few weeks they're in another relationship. And a few weeks after the end of that relationship they're in another relationship. Why is that? Because they are afraid to be alone for a longer period of time and work out why the first relationship went, went, went bust. Our fear causes us to do many things. Our fears then generate... We are addicted to looking after what we are afraid of. Do you understand what I mean by an addiction? Yes? So we become addiction, not, ju not just a, a physical addiction like smoking or drinking or something like that, or eating, but we have emotional addictions. We badly need somebody to give us a certain feeling. If the person gives us a certain feeling, we feel good. If the person doesn't give us that feeling, we feel bad. Right? And they cover our fears. When we are willing to face our fears, we no longer are willing to live in our addictions. When we don't meet our addictions, we often then go into other emotions, such as anger, 
annoyance, frustration, all those kind of emotions. And even right up the top, quite often I would put complete denial. I'm not angry. I'm not afraid. I'm not sad. And so forth. And denial is an intellectual tool, a mind-based tool that we use to get over all of the construction of these different emotions, to get over the pain of having to feel these things. In other words, to get over the pain of having to feel humble. If we were willing to feel humble, uh, willing to feel everything, we would know, oh boy, I feel angry now. Wow, why do I feel angry now? Oh, it's because my addiction isn't getting met. What addiction is it? Oh, I need my partner to every single day feel like, tell me that she loves me. And today she didn't. Right? So now I feel upset and angry. Right? Or I feel my partner, I need my partner to have sex with me every day because that's the way I feel loved. And today we didn't have sex. Now I feel upset, angry. Right? It, humility lets me see these things. Notice what's actually happening. And because we are not humble, and so we go then into pseudo spirituality. Yes. <coughs> when we're not humble, we're not willing to feel these emotions, we then say, all those emotions I don't need to have happen. What I'm going to do is I'm going to create, through my denial, I'm going to create my own happiness. Not realising that I can't be happy until all my grief is gone. I can't be happy until all my fears have gone. I can't be happy until all my addictions are gone. <coughs> then I can be happy. Now, for most of us, that means that we won't be happy for a while yet. <laughs> and that's okay too. It's okay to not be happy for a while until those things are gone. Right? But what we often do is we create a state of pseudo-happiness. We use spirituality to create a pseudo-happiness, a fake happiness. Right? And this is where a large attraction to the New Age movement is. <coughs> to create feelings of happiness, contentment, security, <coughs> right? that we have to work on every single moment to create. You know, this is why there's meditative techniques involved and so forth and so forth, because it, you have to work on it to create it. What I'm suggesting to you is if you follow things God's way and actually feel all of your grief and feel all of your fear and feel all of your addictions and even feel your anger when you need to feel it, right? not act upon it but feel it, what will happen is you'll release those things from you. When you release those things from you, you are now capable of complete happiness right? and you don't have to do a thing to be happy. You get to the point where you don't have to meditate to be happy. You don't have to think about happy thoughts to be happy. You're just automatically happy. Right? And once you become a one with God, in fact, you can become automatically happy all the time. No sadness, no grief, no fear, no anger, ever. Always happy. <coughs> That's the potential you have. And it makes sense that a loving God would provide that potential, would it not? Yeah. And I feel what happens for the majority of people is they're not willing to feel their own grief. And so what do we want? We want other people to make us feel better. <coughs> we want other people to make us not feel sad, to cheer us up. Right? And we're not willing to feel our fear, so what we want is to either feed our fear, instead of feeling our fear, we feed it. Like, we get the newspaper because every day, because we're afraid to not do that. Right? We're afraid to not read the newspaper, even for one day, because we need to know what's happening in the world, so that it makes us feel like we know, and therefore can feel less afraid of what might, might be happening. We feed our fears, we try to make our fears go away by giving our fears more information. That's what we try to do. And our addictions, we finish up feeding our addictions. So 
So many of us finish up with physical addictions, like we eat too much, or we drink too much, or we smoke too much, or we do all, so all sorts of things too much. Or, for the majority of us, it's the emotional addictions are even worse. We have to get certain feelings from other people, or we don't even like them. And, and if we meet a person who never gives us any good feelings, we don't like them at all. <laughs> because they don't give us any good feelings. Does that make sense? And that's because we have our addictions we want met by other people. And then we find ourselves, whenever our addictions aren't met, we go into anger every now and then. Frustration, annoyance, because our addictions are not being met. Yeah? And that's an indication that we are unable to feel our fears. Because if we were willing to feel our fears, we wouldn't want our addictions met. So all of these things, if we're humble, we will feel them. If we're not humble, we will deny <coughs> our existence. We will make them go away, we'll try to make them go away with techniques. So, when I was younger, I had to have a massage every single week. This was when I was working, you know, 100 hours a week. I had to have a massage every single week. If I didn't have a massage every single week, I'd feel really annoyed that I couldn't get my booking. I used to book it in advance. Uh, months in advance, every single week. Mm. Yeah. Because I didn't want to feel what that, was, what that made me f get over, what that made me you know, avoid in my life. Now if I have a massage, it's a very pleasant experience that I have occasionally. But it's not every single week without fail. Yeah. Because it's no longer an addiction. How many of you in the morning, you get up in the morning, the very first thing, what is it? Coffee. 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 <laughs> Why is that? What does coffee do for you? Makes us up. Sure. It makes, you know what's happening for many of us with coffee? You see, when we're asleep, we do things. Right? In our, what I call our sleep state, we're doing things. See, sometimes in our sleep state, so when we're asleep, our, if we can think about it this way, I'll just draw it. Here's our physical body laying down. What happens is our soul and our spirit body, so our soul and our spirit body, leave our physical body and they go to locations in the spirit world. The problem for many of us is that the, the locations we go to in the spirit world stress us out. And, there's this, and then on the way back to the earth, we go through, there's a level of darkness around us usually, uh, associated with the earth and what's happening around the earth. So on the way back, there's this fear that comes in place straight away, on the way back to our body. So when, when we wake up in the morning, these two join again. And in that moment, the very first thing we want is something to make our fear not feel as bad. And something to make our sadness not feel as bad. We need a pick-me-up of some kind. Something that will get us going and moving. And so most of us turn to some kind of stimulant. Yes? I don't know about my drawing of a cup here. <laughs> right? Coffee. The coffee picks us up. And it's the caffeine that we're really addicted to, not the coffee. Because if you, the reality is, the way they manufacture coffee now, you can have coffee without caffeine. I wonder how well that would do <laughs> as a sale item. In Australia, we have this place that only sells coffee without caffeine. Really nice coffee too, really tasty coffee. But, but it doesn't have as much demand because it's without the caffeine. And it's the caffeine, the drug, the caffeine, gets the system going and helps us to avoid some emotions. It's helped us to avoid humility, to get away from them. My suggestion is if every single morning you have a cup of coffee, for the next one month, try not having a coffee. 
<laughs> Try it for one month and see what emotions come up. We we'll see how you really feel in the mornings. How about using wonderful classical music instead of coffee? Okay, so then we go for an alternative. <laughs> so now we go for, a, and this is what happens a lot in new age circles too, yes? We substitute one thing for another thing. So I get coffee and I go, okay, coffee's not good for me, uh, it's causing issues for my heart or whatever else, I explain it away to myself. And so instead what I do is I substitute that with something else whatever that other thing is. Now, for some people on the New Age Pass, it might be meditation. Right? Or classical music. Now, they, they have less effect on my body, so I justify it and I say, I will have these instead because it has less effect on my body. But aren't I really creating another addiction to replace the other one? Wouldn't it be better to find out the reason why I needed to have those things. And this is called another law, a law of cause and effect. Wouldn't it be better to find out what the cause of me waking up feeling quite agitated and upset mm -hmm. is, than it would be to try to deal with the effect of the agitation. Does that make sense to everyone? Mm -hmm. yeah. You can see that if we deal with the cause, then it's permanent. We fix it forever. If we deal with the effect, we're going to need to listen to our classical music every day or need to meditate every day instead of having our coffee. Isn't one an addiction just as the other? This one's a bit higher addiction maybe because it's damaging us physically maybe, but it's still an addiction. It's still an emotional addiction. Can you see that? Could the cause not that it's going very deep down in the, in the chakra? Um, no, the cause is not about your chakras, it's about your emotions. No. All right, it's always about emotions. Your emotions create your chakras. So, so even if you look at, so for those of you who have been interested in spirituality, you know that there are seven main chakras in your body, and then there are, I think it's 192 or something, other chakras in your body. Every single one of those chakras is affected by an emotion. So if you, if you sort out the emotion, then the chakra is automatically sorted out. You don't have to worry about the chakra. But if you sort out the chakra without sorting out the emotion, then the very next day you're going to have to sort out the chakra again. And again, and again, and again, and again. Can you see it's the same as doing this? It's just another addiction. Another thing that's not fi fixing up the cause. So what we need to do is we need to focus on the cause of why we feel bad when we wake up in the morning. Could, we, could the chakras help us to find out? Uh, they can help us, mm -hmm. but they are not the cause, they are the effect. Yeah. Yeah. So they can help us, so we can say, okay, I can feel here in my second chakra, I, I wake up and there's all this tightness in here and it feels bad and I feel a bit sick and all that. That can help us find what the emotion is, mm -hmm. but it's easier to just feel the emotion. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you know? Or this chakra here, which is very much a chakra around your fear. Your fear dominates this chakra, right? So if you find you every week you've got to go and get some spiritual healing and the person does a bit there and they say, oh, this is blocked here again. And you, they do that and then two weeks later you go back and they say, oh, this is blocked here again. And do that again and so forth and get that open. But the problem is, it's your fear. Where is your fear coming from? You need to address that. When you address that, this will automatically be open. Yes? But only because of certain feelings we have within us. So what, what are we afraid of? We've got to find what we're afraid of. Now, for many of us, we don't like our life on earth very much. We feel frustrated, annoyed, upset with it. We don't want to change. We feel a lack of desire. We feel a lot of fears in our day-to-day -day awake life. And when we go into the spirit world, we don't have them as much. And then when we come back, we have them more. And then when we go sleep again, we don't have them as much. So, so when we come back, we're afraid of coming back because we don't like our life here. Now, what do we do there to fix up the course? Fix up our life. If we fix up our life, we'll be looking down from the spirit world going, I want to go back, <laughs> you know, into that life. 
But, but for the majority of us, we don't do that because we don't like that life. We don't like the restrictions in that life, our day-to-day -day mundane drudgery that many of us have. And so we are afraid of entering our body. We need to find the reason why. We need to find the cause, rather than try to fix the effect. And that's an actual law that I've just discovered, called the law of cause and effect. It's an actual law that God has made for the adjustment of the universe. If you don't find the cause, it's pointless dealing with the effects over and over and over again. Pointless. It's like, it's try. I, I often uh, liken it to imagine you have three children. And those three children are like monsters. So let's call them the three monsters. <laughs> From the moment they wake up in the morning to the moment they go to sleep at night, all they do is cause destruction. Now, if you're one person, you can go around fixing up their destruction. Day after day after day after day. Can't. So you imagine, you wake up in the morning, by the time you open your eyes, you walk into another room and there's the destruction all ready for you to fix up today. And so you start your day-to-day -day effort. You know, tidying up, cleaning up, vacuuming the floor, doing all the things, fixing up after these monsters, as they are creating more. Right? So, so by the end of the day, you might have cleaned up a bit, but if there's three monsters, highly unlikely you've cleaned up the whole lot. You go to bed exhausted. You wake up the next morning, what's ready for you the next morning? Exactly the same thing, possibly worse. You go through the whole day trying to tidy up after them. You go to bed exhausted. You wake up the next day. You get the idea? No, you exhausted. Wake up the next day, exhausted. Wake up the next day. After a week of this, what are we feeling? Angry, upset. Right. And the reason why is because we are not changing the cause. What's the cause? Three monsters causing destruction. That's the cause. We need to stop them causing destruction. Right? This is what our life's often like. We often have these monsters in our life, our, some emotions that we have unhealed, causing destruction in our life, and we're going along afterwards, running along behind, trying to fix up the effect. And we never address the cause. If we address the cause, we'll fix it up today. Any single, single thing in your life that's going wrong, you can fix up, usually within a day. Permanently, I mean. Right? But we have to address the cause. We can't just address the effect. And this is one of the fundamental truths about God and the universe. The problem with mankind is we are addicted to dealing with effects and not causes. So, you know, in Sweden, how many laws are there in Sweden? Do you know? It's Most of you have no idea, right? It's impossible to say. It's impossible to say, yeah, because it must be huge, hundreds of thousands of them, potentially, maybe even more. Right? Every single day you might be doing something that breaks one of those laws, right? And you'll have no idea until somebody actually takes you to court, or somebody, and then you become aware, generally. Now, why is that the case? Why do we have so many laws? Because what we do when something goes wrong, instead of fixing the cause, we create a law to fix the effect. That's what we do. Right? And we create another law to fix the effect, and another law to fix the effect, and so forth, until we've got thousands of laws, or hundreds of thousands of laws, all done to fix the effects. Now, can you see how most of the causes have to do with love? If the whole population was loving, how many laws could you get rid of? <laughs> the majority of them, couldn't you? If all of us were loving and we were consistently loving with each other, you could get rid of the majority of laws. Yeah? But the way society is now, we can't do that because nobody seems to want to be loving to each other. And so what we need to do is make laws to prevent them from doing things. And then what do we do with those laws? Every law has a punishment system, does it not? So, I do something that's unloving. And all of a sudden, everybody else says, that was pretty unloving. We've got to create a law to stop him from doing that. So they create a law, and the law has a punishment. So we'll put you in jail for 30 days for doing that. 
Mm -hmm. right? That's the punishment. But does that correct me? Does that change me? It might a little, but does it actually change the reason why I did what I did? No. no. And this is the problem we face on the planet. We need to start changing the reasons why we do things rather than actually changing the action. That's the law of cause and effect. So, so can you see how the, if we enable ourselves to look at these three things, we can start looking at all these different laws and all these different principles around the place and we can start seeing the logic and start seeing where we need to make changes. And if we're humble, we will make the changes. We will. If we're not humble, we will not. So we can solve every problem with the, your motto here? Yes. Every, every problem on the planet can be solved with these three things. <laughs> if it's fully engaged by every person on the planet, of course. <laughs> which is the difficulty. But, but the issue we face, though, I feel, is that it needs to begin with somebody. You see? You see, what most of us do is we look at those strange things and we start applying them and we start seeing the logic and we start saying, yes, I can see how if all of us did that, things would be very, very different on the planet. Mm. But the problem is, my next-door neighbour doesn't want to do that. Mm -hmm. He wants to yell at me every time I do something he thinks is wrong. And see, I don't feel it has anything to do with my next-door neighbour. I feel it's got everything to do with me first. I need to engage this first before anyone else is willing to even engage it, I need to engage it. So that means that even if everyone is unloving towards myself, I am still going to be loving. If everyone feels that I am to blame, even if I'm not to blame, I'll be humble and I'll feel what it feels like that everybody thinks I'm to blame. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. I'll do that rather than hurt them. <coughs> I'll do that rather than damage them. Uh, are all of us always going to the spirit world every night? Yes. This is what really is happening. Yes, yeah. every night. Uh, yep. Uh, Every night, or every time you go to sleep, not just every night, if you have a nap in the afternoon, you go to the spirit world. I have a short question. When I was 15 and I do a relaxation for the first time in my life, mm -hmm. I separated from the body, mm -hmm. and I could see my body laying down there, and, mm -hmm. and then I slowly went down and I felt very happy. Yep. I felt so happy because I told my mom when I was five that we have a soul that lives in the body. Yep. She thought I was a weird person. <laughs> yep, yep. Anyway, and I, I, I got proof for that. Exactly. Know? How many of you have felt that? The leaving of the body, the return to the body? Mm -hmm. Yep. Many of you have felt that? It happens every night, every day. Yeah. <laughs> many of us not conscious of it. Yeah. Some? I have a personal question. Mm -hmm. Um, my mom did a lot of things for me, and my mom did a lot of things for me, and um, I think four months ago I moved out. Yep. And um, since then I have problems in my bones. Which my side? Right hand side. Right side, yeah. And um, I, I'm vegan, mm -hmm. but um, I feel something is missing in my in my diet, but that's the, the effect stuff. That's the effect, yep. yeah. Yeah, but um, I was just wondering whether... And because I don't feel that drawn to go home again. Yep. So you feel a weakness deep within your bones. Yeah. Yep. What's happening with your bones? What do you feel? Is it a pain or a weakness? No, it's more a, a constant thing. That I'm walking uh, one hour. I have, have heavy stuff with me, and it's more um, a constant. It's not that I, I feel like oh my shoulder is hurting or on my knee, but it's more like a constant. So it's a lack of strength. Yeah. In those. Yeah. Yep. And yep. I was just feeling like because I like to uh, create um, meals for myself. Yep. But I don't know what. Well, it's, it's a it's a obviously linked to your mother, right? Yeah. But it's it's linked to how you feel about yourself when there's no woman around. Does that make sense? Yeah. So when you feel bad about yourself, when there's no woman around, there's no woman around telling you you're a good lad and, and giving you emotions that make you feel good about yourself, that you're looked after and cared for. And sometimes we, when we're home, we, you know, mum makes us a lot of meals and, and does our washing for us, many of the guys, that's the case, and uh, looks after us generally. And so we feel like we're important, you know, we've, and we're, we've got a woman making us feel like we're important. When we leave home, 
Now that woman's not around making us feel important every day, she's not doing those things for us, we have to do them for ourselves. And there's an emotion in us often that we, we don't feel complete without the woman doing it. This is why a lot of men then go and try to find a woman their own age that they can live with who does those things for them. Yeah. Yeah. I, I like to do the things for myself because I feel like it's, it's good. Yeah. It's a good thing, but still... But there's an emotion, a yeah. feeling that was coming from your mum that, uh, that you're not now getting. Yeah. So what does your mum feel about you now? She wants to have me at her. Exactly. So she disapproves of you living by yourself, yes? Yeah. And as a result of that, you then feel the weakness of yourself living by yourself. Yet there's a dependency on her. Yeah. Not a physical one, but a emotion, an emotional one. If you feel your way through that, the feeling of strength will return in your right side. Yeah. 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 Okay, really. um, I have a question about the leaving your body when you're ready to go to sleep mm -hmm. and then it yanks back really quickly. Mm -hmm. yeah, and then there's a bit of a jitter feeling as well, a bit of uh, it upset. So, it feels like the whole body is, is moving when it comes back so fast, but it's not even, you're not even asleep a minute. Mm -hmm. yep. so what, is it? what happens when you, um, when you go to sleep? The primary sensory apparatus becomes your physic, your spiritual body. So I don't know if everyone's aware, but uh, I know Katarina is, but I'll just draw this for everyone. Your basic construction at the moment is this. You have a soul. For me, it's male, so it's a masculine soul. Connected to a masculine spirit body. Connected to a masculine physical body. Yep. For a, a female, it's the same. Spirit body and physical body. Yep. Now, when you go to sleep, the spirit body and the soul pull, pull away from the physical body and there is a cord that joins the two, which is called a silver cord. It's a name that we give it when we're spirits. It's, a, it's a sort of like a cord. It goes from the base of your skull right the way down to your tailbone. It's a physical thing that connects your bodies together. And it stretches every time you go to sleep. It, it, it's like a physical cord that stretches. Okay. Make sense? Yeah. Is it the same when you would die? Uh, when you die, it snaps. Oh. Yeah, it actually separates yeah. and snaps. Yeah. Yep. If it has never, if it doesn't snap, then you're not dead. No. Right. So um, people who uh, are able to be resuscitated, the actual cord has never snapped because if if it snaps, you cannot be resuscitated. Does that make sense? Yep. Resuscitated meaning like brought back to life. Isn't there more cores uh, than only one core, and, and that it takes some days to, to leave the body totally with a connection? No, there's only one cord, one cord. but uh, the cord has, is the transmission of all signals. So all signals from the mind and from the body of, this, of the spirit body go through this cord into this, into this uh, body. Yep. So it takes some time? Or no, it can snap instantly. So, for example, if uh, somebody chops off your head with an axe, yeah. it would snap instantly. Uh -huh. right? If uh, somebody, um, if, if you um, get trauma to the rest of your body and, and all of your body functions seemingly cease, mm -hmm. but that doesn't snap, you can be resuscitated. You can be brought back to life, as the saying goes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah? So, so, once it snaps, you cannot be brought back to life, but it does actually snap, it actually tears apart, it, it disintegrates. It's just because I heard it's different from three days to ten days, you know, there's the Tibetans say this and they say that. And I know a lot of people say that, fed, but yeah. what's happening with what they're saying right. is that usually the person who dies then stays around their body. 
because they don't know what else to do. See, most people on earth don't believe they have a spirit body or a physical body. And so when they separate from the body, they often see the body for the first time. And even when the body dies, they want to stay with it. And so the energy that other people feel around the body is actually the person staying with their own body. Yeah. And they'll often stay with their own body, sometimes weeks. Uh, usually when they are actually buried mm. or when they are incinerated, mm. uh, you know, with, uh, you have that here, um, yeah. cremation, yeah. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Um, then they finish up going away from their body. But a lot of times people are very attached to their body, as you can imagine. And so, and so they stay with their body even after their body has died. Yeah. Yeah. And so that's what you feel. And a lot of people then describe that as some kind of connection still going on. And it is an emotional connection. Uh -huh. So this cord is a physical cord that snaps. Mm -hmm. But that doesn't stop the person from having an emotional connection to their body. Okay. Which they often then have for weeks. Yeah. And so some even longer, very long time. some months, and some even many, many years. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yep, many mm -hmm. years. Stay with their body. They watch their body disintegrating. Mm -hmm. oh. yeah. It's a terrible thing yeah. because they don't know what else to do. Yeah. So they, they don't yeah. know what else to do. Knowledge is always the cause of that. Yeah. I'm thinking uh, if the soul leaves the body every night, and a lot of times they don't want to go back to the body. Why then is it so common that it stays after it has died? And uh, you mean why does it come back every morning, mm. and rather than staying in the spirit world and 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 dying, the physical body dying? Is that what you mean? He means why does well, Sorry, but Why do you stay when you die? When so many times in the morning you don't want to come back? Ah, oh, yes, yeah. yeah. With the people who stay in their body, uh, or stay around their body after they die, they always generally want to come back to their body at night. And it's just every single person is different. So every person's emotions are different. And that means that some people want to come back to their body in the morning because they like their life on earth better than they like their spirit life. Other people don't want to come back in the morning because they like their spirit life more than they like their physical life. It just depends on the emotions of the person. Does that make sense? Well, and what, what is it that makes them come back then to the body if they don't want to come back? And there is a there is a pull that when this body wakes up or starts the process of waking up, or if through the transmission through this silver cord, there is a physical need that this body has. So, for instance, you have to go to the toilet, right? Then that physical need is transmitted through the cord, because remember the cord still joins the two bodies, and it causes this to be drawn back to this body automatically, to fulfill whatever the physical need is. Now, often what happens is, is there's light, you know, somebody switches on a light, or there's light, you know, through daybreak or something like that, that then causes a physical need to be transmitted through and so the spirit body is drawn back automatically to the physical body. There's also the need to eat and other needs of course as well of this body. And those needs are transmitted through, these, through the silver cord to the spirit body and it pulls the body back into the, spirit, the physical body. Right, no, keep going. Uh, one, one more question. Yep. Uh, is it, uh, what happens with the soul when uh, the core snaps? Yeah. Uh, where, I, I'm thinking about reincarnation and so uh, Yes. Some might reincarnate fast and some don't. And what, what's, what's, why? Do you want to know the truth about reincarnation? Yes. It's <laughs> <laughs> a very good question. And the truth about reincarnation is that almost everything you've learned about reincarnation is not true. Let's describe what is true and then we'll compare the two about reincarnation. There is a strong belief that, and let's talk about what reincarnation is as it is currently known. There is a strong belief that once this physical body dies, 
Obviously the silver cord is no longer intact, so we've got it like that. We've still got the soul. Notice I've drawn it like a half of a soul. So it's actually a half of a soul. Connected to this spirit body with another cord, which is, a, which is all the sensory apparatus go through this cord. Let's call it a, go a golden cord rather than a silver cord. Different kind of cord connecting the spirit body to the soul. You're now in the spirit world. Now there is a theory, the reincarnation theory, is that this spirit body attached to this soul can now reincarnate. So in other words, they can find another physical body and go into it. That's the theory. Right? Now that theory, while it might sound good initially, has a few problems with it. From, from a physical and logical perspective as well as an emotional one. Let's have a look at the problems. You've heard of the term soulmates? Yes? yes. You've heard of the term, some of you think of it as twin flames? Yes. Twin flames or soulmates? So you've heard those terms. Okay. So here's God. God is a combination of masculine and feminine qualities. God creates children which are also a combination of masculine and feminine qualities. Right? And when I say a combination of masculine and feminine qualities, they can be dominantly masculine or dominantly feminine, but they'll still have a blend of masculine and feminine qualities. Yeah? When you incarnate the very first time, two bodies are created for you. So every time somebody has sex and gets pregnant, there are two bodies created, not one. Two. The two bodies are the physical body and the spiritual, the spirit body. Spirit body and physical body. Two bodies. And the soul, the half of the soul, attaches itself to both of those bodies. Understand? So far? Mm -hmm. so any questions about that? Now I explain all of this in a talk called The Secrets of the Universe. And there's another talk I've given called Reincarnation, if you want to know more details. So they're both on YouTube, I think. The Reincarnation talks on YouTube, isn't it? Mm. I'm not sure about the Reincarnation talk, but The Secrets of the Universe talk is on YouTube. Now the other half of the soul goes through exactly the same process. Somebody else gets pregnant, let's say it's a, this one is a female body, female body is created, two bodies created. The feminine half of the soul attaches itself to those two bodies. Everyone with me so far? So we've got two bodies, right now you are two bodies, physical body and a spirit body attached to a soul. The soul is the real you, and the bodies are your sensory apparatus, like a, a robot, that the real you experiences the world. The real you, the soul, experiences the world physically through the physical body. The real, the real you, the soul, experiences the spirit world through the spirit body. The spirit body has eyes, it has ears, it has a sense of smell, taste, and other other. Um, what do you call them? Sensory, sensory, sensory apparatus. Right? The just like the physical body. In fact, the spirit body has more sensory apparatus than the physical body does, but it's still the body. It's still just a tool or like a robot. Yes? Now, if that's the way we're created and that's the way we incarnate, and I'm saying to you that it's the way we incarnate, then can you see that if we pass from death, if we pass through the process of death of the body, only one body dies, which still leaves the other body attached to the soul. Now, there is direct proof of this. If you talk to any spirit, they tell you that they have a body. And, and the spirits who don't believe they have one, often aligns, <laughs> because the spirits who are sincere, they tell you that they have a body. So they still have their spirit body attached to their soul. Now, in the first incarnation, 
the soul separated and it didn't have any bodies. And at the point of, of uh, pregnancy, two bodies are created, not one. Now if that's the case, if we reincarnated without losing this body, this spirit body, then there'd be three bodies. There'd be two spirit bodies and one physical. Right? And so forth and so forth. Every time you reincarnated, you'd have another spirit body, another spirit body, another spirit body, another... And you'd end up with 500 spirit bodies, or 1,000 spirit bodies, as the, if you think about reincarnation currently is. And I'm suggesting to you that's not what happens. What happens to reincarnate is the spirit bodies also have to die. They also have to be disconnected from the soul. And that's an entirely different process, one that I can describe to you, but it's an entirely different process than the process of death. Right? Death of the physical body. Until that occurs, reincarnation cannot occur. Now, there are many spirits in the spirit world who believe in reincarnation because they were taught it on earth. And so they pass over into the spirit world still believing in reincarnation. And what would you do if you believed in it? You would try to reincarnate, would you not? And many of them do try. And they can't reincarnate. Instead, what they finish up doing is overcloaking another person on earth who is in a body. They actually finish up sharing the body of another person on earth. Right? Now, I've talked to literally millions of spirits who have done this through my life, and I know it to be a fact. And through the discussion of some of the, um, you know, we might be able to have some spirit discussions that we can talk about this being a fact with you. But this is what actually happens. Now, for reincarnation to actually occur, these two bodies also have to have disappeared, and the two halves of the soul have to be rejoined. They have to go through a unification process. You follow me so far? Mm -hmm. Now, when does that occur? Well, here we are on Earth. Initially, we're separate. We've got the two bodies, huh? and the feminine half of the soul. Yeah. And it, by the way, it could be two males and two females. It just depends on what the attraction is, and we can describe that later. I'm just drawing it that it, what it is about 80 to 90 percent of the time. Once we pass, those bodies have died. They now disintegrate into the elements. They are no longer important to the whole procedure. The spirit is now living in the spirit world. Half of the spirit, the half of the soul, living in the spirit world. Right? With the body, a spirit body. Initially, the body looks very similar to the one that your body looks on earth. It has a very similar genetic code, uh, just, just different type of form, that's all. And what happens is to actually amalgamate the two halves, you have to progress in love. You have to progress 22 times through 22 different dimensions. And it's not just times, because there's literally hundreds of things in each dimension to learn. But as you progress, the two halves go through transitions. So this is one dimensional, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. And in seven there is a major transition. And then it goes up a step further. And just before the 22nd there is another major transition. The transition here is the bodies are lost. And the two halves of the soul rejoin with each other. Without their bodies. Because you don't need them anymore. You're now one soul again. But now you're a soul that has a long history of experience. And you have a huge understanding of the universe and how everything works as a result of that experience. At this point here is when you become at one with God. That's what I termed in the first century being born again. 
you change your form. The soul changes in that place to become soul dominant, not mind dominant. And then you continue growing and eventually the two halves of the soul reach the point where they join with each other. And that's called by spirits a soul union. Once the soul is unified, it's able to reincarnate. It cannot reincarnate before then. Yeah. Tell us about your my story. story. Yeah. And what's the time? It's, <laughs> it's two and a half. Half past three. It's probably time to have a break. Yes. And what if after the break I tell you about our story? Yes. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. How about we do that? So what if we have a break now? There's some food on the back. I notice some of you have brought to share, that's awesome. Enjoy yourself and maybe if we start again at uh, about half an hour's time. Yeah.